Speak, God. <laughs> or speak to my heart, God. <sighs> you know, the scripture says that he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. And I find great comfort in realizing that God is always aware of us at all times. But there isn't anything that he doesn't know, he doesn't see, he's not already planned out, hasn't already coordinated, and hasn't already taken care of. Because of that, it makes me <laughs> foolish if I don't check in with him to find out what he has in store or what he's already planned out for today. For him, it's a rerun. For me, it's first run. So, checking the script to find out what role I'm playing today or what person I am to be today is probably the highest priority that I could have in knowing God and walking with Him. And the same for you, because we all have roles that we are, not that we play them, but we are. You're a mother or you're a father, you're a provider, you're a, a worker, you take care of your children, you raise up your parents at times when they get old, you know, you provide for your neighbor, you care about your pastor, you go to your church, you participate in the political process or the social agenda, you pray, you consider the world and its ways, you look to Israel, you consider it. And likewise, God, aware of all these things, causes us to be still for a moment to say to us, to say to you, I have something for you. And I call that devotionals. <laughs> you can call it Bible studies or hearing from God or whatever you want. I just call it my evotional. When joy is shattered, <clears throat> have people ever robbed you of your joy? Perhaps someone spoke a cross or painful or critical word, and in an instant your joy was gone. Yeah. <laughs> How did you respond? Ticked. <laughs> Possibly the phone rang. A letter came. A friend stopped by. And what you learned shattered your joy. Maybe it was something about your child, your mate, your friend, and in that moment the sun ceased to shine. Darkness and gloom hovered over your heart. What did you do? Or did disappointment rob you of your joy? Disappointment because another's fortune was better than your own? Disappointment over another's failure to be to you what they should have been? How did you react? People can rob us of our joy in so many ways, unless we learn to have the mind of Christ. We are living in a time of unprecedented selfishness where the emphasis is on the individual's personal needs and happiness rather than the good of others and the welfare of the whole. Today the rallying cry is be number one, but when being number one is your goal, then everyone else must be second place, including God. Is this what happens? Is this what happiness and joy are all about? Or should I say, is this what Christianity is all about? Not according to the word of God, or to the example set by our Lord Jesus Christ. In Philippians 2, 5 and 8, Paul exhorts us to have the mind of Christ. Listen to his words with hearing ears. Have this attitude in yourselves, or let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The mind of Christ is a servant mind, the mind that puts obedience to God above everything else, a mind that puts others before self. It is a mind that does not insist on being number one. Take a few minutes to read Philippians 2 right now. See how throughout this chapter we find that this servant mind is modeled not only by our precious Lord, but also by theirs, those who bear his name. Paul demonstrates this mind when he says, 
even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. Philippians 2.17 But Paul is not only our example in this chapter, there is also Timothy who served Paul as a son in the furtherance of the gospel. And there is also Epaphroditus who, out of concern for others, came close to death for the work of Christ. See Philippians 2.25-30 could this be said of you? Are you concerned for the spiritual welfare of others? For the hurting people of for the hurting world of people who need God's word, as well as our love, care, and concern? Are you willing to give yourself to listening to them, to helping them, to meeting their needs, to showing them what God has to say in his word? Are you willing to take time or make time to pray for them? In other words, do you have the servant mind of Christ? Oh, how we need to say, Here am I, Lord. Use me. Send me. I recall a time when I was in Singapore carrying out a very busy schedule of teaching and speaking engagements. On my one free evening, a young man from that city approached me and asked if he could meet with me for counseling. I must confess I was torn at first about adding time with, my, with him to an already busy schedule, but I told him I could give him 45 minutes. Our time together lasted almost two and a half hours. This young, told, this young man told me that he had been involved in sin with another man for over two years and wanted to commit suicide. As I held him in my arms while he sobbed over the grievousness of his sin, I listened to his tender words of confession to the lover of his soul, the one whom he was to love above all else. Later, as we sat over coffee and I saw the joy that now radiated from his countenance, I thanked God that I had considered this man's concerns about my own schedule and my own pressures. The joy over his repentance was wonderful, but the joy that came because I had been obedient to God's command to have the mind of Christ was far greater. Sometimes, the joy of obedience does not bring such immediate results. It is then we must be reminded of the much greater burden our Lord bore in humbling himself unto death. For during his trial and horrible scourging, his tormentors did not realize that this one they mocked as king of the Jews was about to bear their sins so that they might have eternal life simply by repenting and believing on him. Although we may not see the results from our witnessing, there is still the sense of sweet inward joy because we know we've done what we should. It is not people who should rob us of joy. It is our failure to have the mind of Christ that should do so. Our lives are to be lived for the sake of others. We are to be obedient servants like our Lord, who came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to give his life a ransom for many. Mark 10, 42, 45. Therefore, when you start to lose your joy because of people, stop and ask God how he would have you serve him in this particular self situation. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than ourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, the hardest thing I think in America for people to do is to be a servant of all. We claim we have the freedom to do what we want to do. We claim we have the inalienable right to be and exist and to seek our own happiness and none of those are godly principles it's funny but they aren't god didn't create for you freedom he said that you are in bondage to sin and then when he freed you from sin your choice is to be under the lordship of jesus christ it's not to do your own thing it's to be you could say a servant or bond servant unto god when we say that all men are created equal and they are created by their, they are given by their creator certain inalienable rights. No, you aren't given any rights. Your rights were forfeited from the day that Adam sinned. And I'm sorry that while we live in a wonderful country that promotes a democracy and a certain way of living that we assume and presume that if we had a foundation of God in it, that we could build this structure on top of it that would make it look like and appear to be something that was pleasing and acceptable to God. The true freedom comes in servitude. The true freedom comes in giving up that freedom to God to choose to do as he would direct us to be obedient unto him. There is no freedom in being free. <laughs> That's chaos. 
everything has an order. Everything has a purpose. Everything has a design. And they are constrained by that design that given freedom, you are given the opportunity to decide what you would do with that freedom, which is to give it back to God. So Jesus may save you from your sins, and he may allow you the opportunity to make choices that you feel like are designed, you know, for you to have this quote-unquote freedom. But you better remember that there is from the foundations of the world, God created all things, and all things operate under his purposes and plan, and that he's designed everything to be either a vessel of honor or a vessel of wrath. So your choice, really, is one of yielding that perspective you have to God and recognizing that you are under authority and that you choose to exercise your freedom to be a servant of all. And when you do that, then you find true freedom indeed, because God will open up doors of opportunity that you never imagined would exist. It's sad, but the American way, as much as we love and enjoy, and if you're an American and you're living in America, enjoy that idea of the American dream, but the truth is the American dream is just a dream. What God desires for us is a kingdom of God and his righteousness that has nothing to do with being content in this world. Because if you love the world, and we could say if you love America, if you love the things of this world, if you love the American dream, if you love the ways of this world, if you love our democracy or our whatever, freedom of of free enterprise or any number of things that you could put there, then look back on the history of what Jesus has done through the entire centuries of man and all the kingdoms of this world that have come and gone. And you'll see that each one of them all took pride in the country they lived in. And yet, the faithful few that God called to be unto him always rejoiced not in the place that they lived, but that it was given an opportunity to use where they were at to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to all living things. And that's what you're called to do. You can try to be free, but you're serving somebody, as Dylan said. you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you are serving somebody. And I hope you're not serving yourself.